Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are thankful for the time that we have again in this new week uh, to open up your word together. And we ask for your guidance and help in this study. Um, we know that we have less than five weeks before July 18th, and um, there's much that is being done, and we give our prayers to those who are warning the people in Nashville. And um, we're also thankful, Lord, for uh, the way that you work in our lives individually. Uh, that you're not just concerned about kingdoms and nations, uh, but you're concerned about each individual. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you can work in our lives, continue to, that we may participate in the work that you're doing. We may continue to uh, study and to obey you, and that we can see in ourselves the things that need to change, and that you can provide the strength to do that. Uh, thank you for this study here. Bless each person. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher and guide, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm just gonna, well, I'll maybe do it this way. Now, Stephen already knows about this, so. Now we have, um, so this isn't directly, you know, addressing the lines um, per se, uh, but it is in, in an indirect way. We know that we have these various lines. We have uh, a line called uh, the Levitical chiasm, which goes from March 27th, March 27th, to March 27th. And, and this, this chiasm becomes part of the structure, so we just call this the Levitical. And, and part of this structure then relates to um, the Midnight chiasm, And the Midnight Chiasm has a little bit different structure in that it has 126 days here and 126 days here. There's 63 days on either side of these uh, dates here. Now, we have, you know, October 13th, so I'm just going to do 1013 here. And this is uh, September 7th. This is 11-9. Uh, Etc. This is uh, 25, 12. I guess I would do it the other way. 12, 25. Um, this is uh, June 9th, so that'd be 6, 9. And this is uh, August 11th, so that would be 8, 11. So, so this chiasm here has at, in its center uh, March 27th. So this is 2019, this is 2019, and this is 2019. And, and March 27th, 2019, this is 2020, this is 2021. <laughs> uh, and this is 2019, March 27th, in the center. And, and so this starts it. And um, we also know that, uh, am I doing this right? No, I'm not doing this right. What am I doing? Um, yeah, that was right. Never mind. This is nine. That was wrong at the end there. So this was right. This was right. Eleven nine. And then this one's eleven one or one eleven. So this would be January eleventh. That's what I was doing wrong. There we go. And from this date, um, we count. Um, 63 weeks to, to this date here, March 27th, 2021, I believe. Yeah. So is everybody familiar with what I drawn out, even though you probably can't see it? There at the bottom. So, 
So, yes. so this guy has it here, known as the Midnight Kaiser. Yeah, Stephen, did I do something wrong? No, no. No, no it's fine. Okay. So, so you can see that this this structure here ends up connecting um, to this structure. So that, that's basically what I wanted to show you, that you have this larger chiasm, um, uh, and it's connected to this, to this other chiasm. And, and this chiasm here, which we call the midnight chiasm, this is addressing uh, basically the resolution of November 9th, how November 9th is connected to October 13th, and uh, Jeff coming on September 7th, 2019. Um, and so this structure then, the center of this chiasm here, gives us the key, which is the symbol 273, which is then this chiasm, and it puts down this line, which is about the message to the Levites. So you have a midnight chiasm, and it's connected to a Levitical chiasm. So, you know, hopefully you're familiar with it. Uh, the paper I'm going to send you will go all through it and have it nicely drawn out. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to draw here another chiasm that uh, I just found out yesterday. Uh, this chiasm here has to do with June. 22nd. So June 22nd, um, and uh, we've got a few of these June 22nds. What would be the, the first June 22nd? Anybody know? What year was 2000, this? 2011. So it's 2011. This is when uh, Future for America received $165,000 uh, to start a school, uh, among some other things that they were doing. And so somebody donated that freely, asked them what they needed, they said what they needed, and they got a check for that. And um, then we have, this? Then we have this uh, other June 22nd, and this is 2014. And this is the first camp meeting in Arkansas. So I'll just write here $165,000. And then this one's first camp meeting in Arkansas. Now, uh, they had a second camp meeting uh, that was 120 days later. Uh, which I was at, um, but the important date here is October 22. Um, that's the Wednesday of 2014. And this October 22 date, I'm going to actually do it differently here. I'm going to put it underneath. Um, just two days before, on the 20th and the 21st, I presented uh, in this message uh, chronology. So I was invited because Jeff had seen me present in Alberta, uh, nine presentations, and then he asked me to do them in three presentations in Arkansas. And uh, it's kind of jam-packed. I left out a lot of things out, and people were really confused as usual when I present. Uh, but especially I remember people walking out of the meetings that I was doing um, and uh, saying that this was a waste of their time. To listen to me. So, pretty typical response. Now, <clears throat> we have noticed that from October 22nd, 2014, uh, to November 9th, 2019, is a period of, I'll write it here, 1844 days. And uh, this, this was discovered by Stephen uh, back in the summer of 2018, not, not this particular group of dates necessarily, but relating to um, October 22nd, 1844, counting to November 9th, 18, uh, 
49 and uh, noticing that it was 1844 days and this was part of his whole structure going from the time that Jesus spent in the holy place and, and the time that he could have spent in the most holy place uh, in the second phase of his ministry. But we see that this, this same period of time shows up in our history. Um, uh, so it's an interesting point. And we had just talked about how in, um, for those that weren't here, is that AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, never mind, that's a different thing completely. That, I'm getting mixed up here. Um, but November 9th, I'm going to deal with that later. So that's, yeah, this is something else. Okay, so, um, so 1,844 days from October 22nd to November 9th. Now, this date here is 2017. Now, I, I don't know any particular event that occurred on, on June 22nd, 2017. Um, there, there may have been an event that I don't know about yet. Uh, it could have been videos that were done or something like that, or some kind of truth that was done, uh, presented or understood, but I don't know. But this is a part of the, a, far, a larger structure. Now, um, one of the things that, uh, well, from here, from November 9th, uh, we know that we're going to have uh, this other structure. So this other structure, um, I should have probably put this a little bit more over this way. I'm just going to move this over a bit. So November 9th is over here. Um, and this other structure we know from November 9th to uh, December 25th is uh, 777 days. And we have July 18th over here. 252 days and 525 days. So this is December 25th, 2021. And this is November 9th, 2019. <clears throat> so I'm going to deal with that a little bit later. Now, this part of this chiasm here uh, is uh, an interesting chiasm. It's... Uh, trying to remember how the, the numbers here. I believe this is 1,096 days, and this is 1,096 days. And I can take 1,096, no, that's not right, not right. Um, yeah, it's 548, 548. So, um, this is not part of this larger chiasm that I'm going to look at, but this starts, marks the start of it. So between these two dates, June 22nd, 2011, and June 22nd, 2014, is this date. Um, so I'll put this up here. This date here is December 21st, 2012. Now, we may not all be familiar with this, but I'm sure some of you are. But this is the start of the Mayan calendar. Uh, we call it the 13th Baktun. Somebody asked me the question, well, isn't this the 14th Baktun? But I guess you would kind of look at it like a birthday. When you're one year old, you've already passed one year. When you reach to the 13th Baktun, because there would be a zeroth Baktun, I guess, if you wanted to look at it. Now, we know that this is uh, 1 million... 872,000 um, days from the start of the Mayan calendar because it's 13 times 144,000. So, um, so there's a lot of significance in this date. But we had already figured out uh, a chiasm that starts with December 21st. And that chiasm in, in the paper that I'm going to send you addresses this. Now, one of the things you will see, I'm, not, I'm leaving out a lot of it, but if you go from this date to this date here, uh, June 22nd, 23rd, 
is the center of this. That is, if you go at, at the end of June 22nd, midnight, going to June, starting June 23rd, you find that this is the center of this. Um, so June 22nd belongs to this half of the structure, and June 23rd belongs to this half of the structure. And, and uh, you're gonna see why this is important as we go through these lines, trying to understand who these groups are. So June 22nd, if, if we wanted to um, ask, you know, what does June 22nd symbolize? Of course, we have lots of examples of it, and we've gone through these, because this is our structure and prophetic chronology study. And we know that um, we have here, from creation, 622 years to the birth of Enoch. And then from the birth of Enoch to Methuselah, 65 years. And then it's 187 years uh, up to the birth of Lamech. And Lamech lives for 777 years. And, and, we've, and, and Stephen was the one who connected this. We could take the name of Lamech, um, and uh, we know that uh, if you take the letters for Lamech's name, so they just go like this, and you, add, you multiply them instead of adding them up like you would in a gematria, and this would be 12, this would be one, this would be 13, this would be five, this would be three, and this would be eight. And so you would multiply this, and you get uh, 18,720. So you get this symbol of uh, July 18th, 2020 in Lamech's name. So, so these types of ideas that we can see here, uh, dealing with July 18th, which is the important date in this chiasm, at least for us, even though it's not the center of this structure, it has an important place in this structure. It is the center of a chiasm. If we put uh, March 27th over here, uh, 2021, we know March 27th is uh, 252 days. So July 18th is the, the center of this chiasm between November 9th and March 27th, uh, 504 days, July 18th in the center. Um, so, so we know we have this, this structure. Now, December 21st, if you go from December 21st, uh, so we went to here and we went to here, I guess I should finish this off. You know, this is the center. And this whole structure is a period of uh, 3,291 days. And I deal in the paper of how to count these days. There's different ways you can count them. Uh, but the best way to count them is to make this transition between June 22nd and June 23rd as the middle and to have that as your number. And um, this number, this 329.1, if you remember that chiasm that I had showed you where you had uh, what we call the, the midnight chiasm, where we had October 13th over here and September, uh, September 7th over here, and that center date, which was March 27th, uh, 2019, this period here is 329 days. So it's, it's basically one-tenth of this plus one, this whole period. So there's so many different ways, and I go through it in the paper, uh, but I just wanted to address it because I want to address uh, 622. So we, we know we have 622 shows up here. Um, and this, this date here would be what we call 622 AM, Anno Mundi, in the year of the world. But we also have 622 BC, and that's uh, connected with the book of Ezekiel, uh, and with Josiah's Passover. And we also have January, or July 18th, 622 AD, which is the Gregorian date that starts the Islamic calendar. So 622 shows up in its connections with the symbols uh, of July 18th in various ways. Um, so it's just kind of a remarkable uh, point. So yeah, when you get the paper, 
uh, and it's not the final edition of the paper, so it's it's getting there. Uh, you know, I want to put it up on my academia site. You know, this week hopefully it would be nice. So now we're going to look at these lines and try to understand them. And I know last week. Some people found it confusing. I wasn't really trying to confuse people. We, we did get a little bit distracted. And um, we also, uh, you know, we had some questions. There was some responses from people who were sitting here um, that sort of distracted me a bit. But also it was a different, I was trying to show you how confused we are. That is, my view is that we don't fully understand the lines. Not, not that the message doesn't. But I think as individuals, uh, we don't. But it could also be that there are some things, some points that we haven't seen. Um, so I think we generally understand the lines as a movement. Obviously, we're not like totally out to lunch on that. Um, but there are some details that we obviously miss because that's just the nature of being human. And of course, God unfolds these things as time goes on. So when we look at the line of the Millerites again, so I'm going to try to get us out of the world of confusion, out of this world of darkness, into the world of light. And we know we have all these way marks, but uh, I'm going to just kind of simplify this a little bit, at least here. Um, you know, so you got October 22nd. Uh, that's the third angel arrives. And you have, um, yeah, I guess I'll do that. Um, yeah, April, uh, April 19th, the second angel arrives. And then we have over here, the first angel arrives, 1798. Now, some people in, in looking at this in the past, you know, they put the first angel in different places. You know, they marked this is the time of the end, and they didn't necessarily have the angel arriving at the time of the end. Um, but we eventually came to that conclusion uh, because we, we noticed that there was these different way marks, you know, the increase of knowledge, which leads to, um, you know, this would be in 1818, and then you would have 1833, which would be uh, the first angel is formalized, and then you would have... Uh, August 11th, 1840, which would be the first angel is empowered. First angel empowered. And, and then we have this arrival of the second angels. Maybe I can move this over. So this is 1844, that we have all these final things occur. And then we're going to have a formalization. See, and I will put the second angel as formalized at Boston. And um, the second angel is empowered at Exeter. This is how I would do it. Different people might do some of this differently. Um, but I think it's formalized because that's when the announcement is made. But here is when it's actually empowered. So to me, that seems pretty clear. Now, as far as the groups we talked about, we know that uh, Protestants are over here. And this is a, where they go through a thing called the Protestant Reformation. They're, the Christians are being persecuted, but Protestants go through this, this Reformation. And um, by the time they get to 1798, they're no longer being persecuted. And they actually have this opportunity uh, to give the gospel to the world. So this period of time opens up uh, because of the United States partly, but because of the changes that are happening in the world, a lot more freedom. And so Christianity begins these Bible societies. There's all kinds of revivalists going through the United States and Europe. Um, so there's a revival in biblical knowledge, the increase of knowledge, uh, here is relating to biblical knowledge, not airplanes and boats and ships and all those types of things, and trains. 
and um, and then you have uh, this this message that's going to be given to the Protestants to test them. So the Protestants are going to be tested, and then on this side of it, we're going to have the Millerites are going to be tested by the second angel's message, and then the third angel's message is going to introduce a new group of people, which we would call Seventh Day Adventists. So let's do it this way. We're going to say Protestants, Millerites, and then over here we have SDAs. And, you know, I, I think this is kind of understood. Now, in, in this whole thing, when we look at these groups, um, you know, the groups that are being tested, I mean, they're obviously giving a message to lots of people who aren't uh, Protestants. I mean, they might be raised Protestants or something, but their worldly people are receiving this message. Um, but many, after the passing of the time of the, the first message, you know, there isn't as many people left, about one-tenth of the people who had been following Miller are now uh, what, what we might call staunch Millerites. They still accept the message. They're still receiving the papers. They still believe it. They endure some mocking, and they're going through this tarrying time. And then, of course, we know the third angel arrives, and we have this new group of people, Seventh-day Adventists. And Seventh-day Adventists are going to go through a reform line of their own, but that reform line is going to fail. And so we talked about this, where you have uh, 1850, uh, 1863, and 1888. Uh, that's the way that I understand this. And so this would be the fourth angel here. Um, now, of course, this is the first, second, and third, but this is the fourth fourth angel's message, at least that's where it's supposed to accomplish its work. But it doesn't. In this first generation, Adventism is going to fall away. Now we know that the third angel arrives here, and it's going to continue until it's joined by the fourth angel, which occurs in our history. So when you get to our history, you have back here the fourth generation in 1957. And you're going to have this period of darkness. And then you're going to have the events of 1989. Um, and, and you're going to have uh, Reagan, who works with the Pope uh, to overthrow the Soviet Union. Right? So you're going to have these times of the end. I guess I can put this up here. This is the time of the end. This is Daniel 11, verse 48, and Daniel 11, verse 40 B. And in, in this line, this is where I think that we've, we've had some problems, because we know that Seventh-day Adventists are here in the time of the end, because they're in a period of darkness. And there's a period of darkness here. And, and, and the question is, you know, who's in darkness? Why are they in darkness? I, I think that's a question that we often don't ask. Uh, the other thing which I've tried to emphasize for quite a few years is that a reform line addresses the period of darkness that precedes it. Now, you could see this, let's say, the classic example would be the Egyptians, the Israelites, when they come out of Egypt, their reform line is addressing them coming out of Egypt. That's what their reform line is. Or um, the reform line of the Babylonian captivity. They're coming out of the Babylonian captivity. The literal temple has been destroyed. The literal temple is going to be built. So there's these, uh, these events that happen, and you have this period of darkness, the captivity, which is followed by this reform line that leads them out of captivity. So it's just very, very logical. And you see that in the time of Christ, the people that dwelt in darkness saw great light. And that darkness was the darkness that had come over the Jews because of their apostasy. Now, their apostasy was different than all previous apostasies because the previous apostasies was they worshipped false gods and they had wandered away from God. They had interbred with other uh, groups. They, they adopted their, their religion. Uh, but here in this period, they had become exclusive. They'd gone to another extreme. 
And that darkness was the darkness of formalism. Um, they had lost sight of the significance of, of the Jewish economy. And Christ come, his reform line addresses that by fulfilling the types of, in the Jewish economy. So you can see that that light that comes from Christ is directly addressing the darkness. Now we know in, in this history then, that darkness was the darkness of persecution. And you can see the increase of light is this freedom that comes from the Catholic, being persecuted under the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church receives its deadly wound. And this reform line, now that they're free, is, is actually addressing another thing that goes all the way back to the Babylonian captivity, which was the rebuilding of the temple, the establishment of the people. You can see that in the time of Christ, the close of probation for the Jewish nation in 34 AD. Those time prophecies are addressed here, and God is going to establish a new people. So they've been uh, in this period of darkness. They went through all these, these progressive destruction of four, and now God wants to establish a people. And in order to establish a people, he needs the sanctuary, which had been lost sight of uh, and dis well, destroyed, and the Sabbath that had been lost sight of. So now in this history, this work is supposed to be accomplished under the three angels' messages but it isn't, right? So we know that we go into darkness. Adventists go through the four generations. In the fourth generation, we have the period of darkness, and then we come to 1989, so we're at the time of the end, and then we say the first angel arrives. Now, so we know that this is about Seventh-day Adventists, and the way that this was addressed, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that this is the way we looked at it, is that Seventh-day Adventists, if, if we're going to look at the time of Christ, for instance, we would say there's the Jewish church, and their Jewish church is going to be passed by. So we know the Seventh-day Adventist church is passed by, as far as the increase of light is concerned. Now, if you try to parallel it here, um, the question of who is who is passed by, we, we, we don't really address, um, because we have this increase of light. But the papacy is not... God's church in any way, where um, in the time of Christ, if I drew it up here, uh, I'm just going to do that, you know, so you got the time of Christ, you know, in uh, the time of the end is 4 BC, right, you got this darkness, right? you can have this increase of light, uh, formalization of the message, um, you know, dealing with Jesus when he goes into the temple, all these types of things, his baptism, which is the empowerment of the first angel's message. Uh, you could look at it that way. There's different ways people actually interpret this line. I'm not always satisfied with it. Uh, but the main point here is you have, you have a church that's being passed by. Now, I don't know who's being passed by here. And, and I'm not saying that there should be, because this is a different reform line in a different context here. Um, and, and if you really wanted to look at it, this is going to parallel uh, the reform line that happens prior to the 2300 days. That's the reform line of Cyrus. Cyrus, Darius, and, and Artaxerxes, the three decrees. And nobody's passed by in 539. It's the, just the end of Babylon. So this reform line here in the time of Christ more closely parallels this reform line here in 1989. Now, there are similarities here, obviously, because this is the, the template that we have for our line. But we need to recognize that this is a line where the third angel's message is already continuing, and it's going to finish off the work that began here. And this work began with Protestants and Millerites. And we know that the Protestants uh, closed their door when the second angel's message arrived. So when Protestants closed the door, um, they failed that first angel's message test, and then you have a new group of people uh, that are going to then be, be tested, which are the Millerites. So this is where the problem lies in trying to lay this out. And I'm not saying that I, I have all the answers to this, but we can see that here, a people being passed by doesn't parallel here, in my view. That is, I don't see somebody being passed by. I see the fall of Babylon, just as we see the fall of Babylon in 539. 
Uh, but here in 1989, we also do have parallels with what happened in 539 BC, right? So, so you know, what we have is we have all these lines coming together, but not every line shares the same details. Um, they have the same way marks, but the, but the information that's attached to some of those way marks is different. And, and I would call it, you know, either a triple or a quadruple application or a multitude application of prophecy. You take the characteristics of each of the lines and you line them up. And so you can see that in here, um, there's going to be a kingdom that comes to an end, which is the USSR. Um, so you could compare that with the fall of Babylon if you want. But you also have a church that is being passed by as you did in the time of Christ. So the light that's going to come, this increase of light that's going to come, and it's going to be formalized in 1996, is the line, is the light about the reform lines themselves. And, and we talked about this where the, the original reform lines were very, very simple. You know, you have the time of the end, you have Sunday law, and you have close of probation and you're going to have the second coming after that but this is this line where there's this test is occurring the two steps are different there are three steps but these this step and this step so you're going to have this test and this test are different in each of these lines as we start to add up the detail so obviously after 9-11 9-11 moved into the place uh, in the middle and the sunday law went over here. Um, so the Sunday law now represents the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. And then we kept zooming in. So we then, you know, took out the, the time of the end. And then we had way marks in between 9-11 um, and the Sunday law. And sometimes we had, you know, the Sunday law, close of probation over here. So we moved it around at different times, depending on what we were illustrating. Um, and that happened through the years. Just, and basically, we were zooming in on this reform line from this large group of people that we first talked about as being first the church, then the world. Um, so the way that we would have looked at this uh, here is we would have had 9-11 here. And of course, this is also 9-11. So this is just one way mark in here. We'll just add those together. This parallels here. This parallels here. And we would have seen this as a chat test uh, for the church, uh, for the church leadership that is going to be completely passed by by 9-11. And then we're going to have these other groups. And, and this is where I have the problem, because when you look at Millerite history, the way that we've understood it, is we really haven't seen other groups. We have Protestants, Millerites, Seventh-day Adventists. So, you know, trying to say, well, who's being tested here? who failed at 9-11, if we're going to look at this as a parallel of, of this history, um, you know, we would probably say Seventh-day Adventists failed, at least the organization. Um, but then we have another group of people that we've zoomed into, uh, which are the Seventh-day Adventists who, it's not about the organization, it's about the individuals, and we've categorized them into two groups, priests and Levites. But we have the priests starting over here. Now, I don't want to go into some of the, uh, the different types of models. Like, I don't want to draw them all out. But we had different models. We had uh, the construction model. Um, and all these models had been manipulated in this message. That is, they were twisted for a purpose. And, and we didn't quite catch it. And, you know, maybe I should spend a bunch of time going through all that. But I'm not. Just because, um, you know, to me, it's, it's just too much to go through. Um, but but we, we can sort of picture that this idea that we have like a construction model, we have, which, which has to do with the building of the temple. Um, and, and things were sort of forced, in my view, into place to try to understand how that model applied. We had the agricultural model. Uh, the agricultural model had to do with plowing and sowing and a time for it to, to grow and sprout and the rain that would come down and then the harvest. 
And, and so these models were laid out for different groups. Um, so we had the priests, the Levites, the Nethinims, and the 144,000, th this big line, which you know we're, we should all be familiar with, because that's the line, if we've been in Adventist for a long time, that we always knew. We always knew the big line of the 144,000. Um, the other model was, uh, it doesn't come to mind at the moment. Um, marriage. The witch? The marriage. Yes. I always forget that. Um, so we have the line of, of the marriage. Now, you know, another line that we could have used, I mean, in, in, start, in talking about the line of the marriage, is understanding the parable of the ten virgins. Because that's, that's related to the line of the marriage. Um, and there, there's a lot made about these different lines. But if you, if you put them all together, they're going to show you different things. And, and they're not always going to address the same people, depending on your application. And I've mentioned before that Ellen White has three applications of the parable of the ten virgins. She has the application that applies to the Millerite history. She has an application that applies what I would call the general application, just it's in Christ's object lessons. So if you read that one there, that's the one where she's just talking generally about the end of the world. Um, she's talking about Christians. It, it's, it's, it's really written for non-Adventists to understand that line. Um, but the other one that she has is the repeat of Millerite history. When she says the parable of the ten virgins will be repeated to the very letter, she's talking about our line. But when I say our line, the question is, who is the our? Because we have different groups. If we have priests, we have Levites, we have Nethanim, what we've done is we've taken all of these symbols of midnight, midnight cry, close of probation, um, and we've applied them to these different groups. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying that we haven't really defined how we get who those groups are. Now, if we were going to look at uh, the reform line with the Babylonian captivity, uh, one thing that we will see is we have a number of prophets. Uh, you know, Isaiah even prophesies about the end of the Babylonian captivity, even though he's prophesying long before it actually occurs. Um, we also see that, of course, Jeremiah, who's uh, prophesying during the time of the Babylonian captivity up until uh, Zedekiah's captivity, um, you know, he's, he's prophesying about the end. Of course, we have Daniel, who's there all through the Babylonian captivity, and he's addressing it in these different lines of prophecy, though his focus in the prophecy is not that it's his focus, but God's focus is to extend beyond the, the period of literal Israel and to reach all the way to the period of modern Israel, so to reach to the Millerite time period. And, of course, you have Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel, to me, is the important one in understanding his role. Um, he's an apocalyptic writer. If you want to put him into a class with, with Daniel and John, I think you can. Uh, in, the, in the way that he writes, in the symbolic language, and the types of visions that he has. And, of course, he's prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem, but also the restoration. Um, though, if you read the first part of it, mostly it's about the destruction of Jerusalem that's coming. Um, it's in the latter chapters, chapter 40 and on, that he address more of this restoration. And, and that restoration, um, many people try to take it literally, that the temple being referred to in, in Ezekiel 40 is some literal temple that's going to be built by the Jews um, at the end of time, maybe after the secret rapture, you know, depends on evangelicals, all their different views that they have regarding that. But we know it's symbolic. And actually, if you look at the temple and you look at the measurements, people have made a strong case that it's impossible to build. The measurements don't match up to something that's a literal structure. Um, the other thing about uh, Ezekiel 40 is we see that that same thing's parallel in Revelation chapter 11, um, where you see a very similar scene to Ezekiel 40 with the measuring rod. And, and so we know that, that Revelation 11 is addressing that. Now, of course, somebody could argue that Revelation 11 is dealing with, you know, literal Israel. 
but when you study Revelation, you're really hard pressed uh, to use Revelation in a literal sense. Um, it tells you it's written in symbolic language. Uh, you see all the furniture of the sanctuary uh, being utilized prophetically, um, and you see no indication that there's going to be a temple built on earth before the second coming. The only temple that comes down to earth comes from heaven. It's not built by the Jews. Um, and I've always really puzzled over the evangelical and dispensationalist Protestant view of Revelation. I've done lots of studies where I've, I've been in Bible studies with Christians from other denominations, and they're studying the book of Revelation, and they have no idea how to study it. Um, I've studied with Messianics. They just, they just don't know how to read Revelation. And if you start from the beginning with them and you just start showing them, it's something they've never seen, how to study, how to understand Revelation, comparing these to, the, to the, all these different scriptures, tying everything together. But of course, if you start with the idea that literal Israel is what's going to be fulfilling end-time prophecy, you run into a big problem. So anyway, that's, that's way off topic there. But um, we know here in this history that Protestantism has a fall. And, and Protestantism has a fall where the first horn, so you're going to have uh, Protestantism falls. And then we know in this history, Republicanism is going to fall. Right? So we're going to have the fall of, of Republicanism. So I'll just write it under here. So the second horn is going to fall. Now, of course, we would put that at the Sunday law. Now, I have it, you know, just here, um, not to specifically place where it is. But Protestantism falls here, but Republicanism is going to fall here. Now, we know, um, you know, if we're going to put... I'm just going to get rid of this way mark here and just do this. So we've got the 9-11 here. Now, we know that we're going to have the Sunday Law. Now, the Sunday Law, if, if I was going to place it here, I would put it as the empowerment of the second angel's message. Um, that's where I would put it. Just, you know, maybe I'm wrong here. Um, and then we're going to have the close of probation which I would parallel with the start of the judgment on October 22nd, 1844. And then we have these other way marks in here, and this has, has become uh, fuzzy. And it's become fuzzy for a number of reasons. One is error that was taught, um, and also truths that were buried, and, and, and this confusion of which line we're looking at. Now, we remember that in this line here, the Millerites believed that they were giving the midnight cry. So I'm just going to put here uh, the midnight cry between the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. But we know that the, the true midnight cry occurs over here. So the true midnight cry occurs in this history, not in this history. And how that would relate to our history, um, not really necessarily sure but i would say that initially when jeff uh noticed this that he he placed this idea of this loud cry so maybe i'll just move it over here a little bit and put the sunday one here and we have a thing called the loud cry and the loud cry is like the parallel to the true midnight cry but then he was saying that we have a midnight cry that parallels this midnight cry that precedes the sunday law so I, I hope that's not confusing, but we know that we have here in this history, the midnight cry. And when, when Jeff came up with this idea, and he noticed this, we didn't have midnight yet as a way mark. So, you know, we can put midnight in here. Um, now, as far as uh, loud cry, it, it's obviously a period of time. Now, it was suggested in 2018 that we make it a waymark just like this. Um, and I, I'm not really happy with that. And, and it was, I believe it was forced in, into that for a reason, to try to make these lines fit a certain agenda. But I would say that these are, are periods of time. 
Now, of course, we have midnight cry here as a waymark. So the argument is, why can't we just put the loud cry as one of those waymarks? Um, but I'm not so convinced that we should have the midnight cry as, as a waymark, because um, this is the period of the midnight cry, right? So it is a period of time, not just a point of time. Now, of course, there may be a starting point to it, and maybe there's a starting point to here. Um, but I know that Ellen White says that the fourth angel arrives in this history, and it's going to swell to a loud cry. And so you're going to see this message swelling to a loud cry all the way through. I don't think there's some event where we say, oh, the loud cry has begun now. Uh, the loud cry is just going to swell. So it's not something that can be uh, marked by a waymark. And we can see even in, in here, I mean, this had obviously been growing. At Exeter, it's going to swell here, particularly the seventh month movement that's uh, pointing to October 22nd. So at Exeter on August 15th, you're going to see it swelling uh, to this cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And uh, we know that this loud cry, in understanding the symbol, this loud cry is paralleling that midnight cry. But we also have a midnight cry over here. So that means we have another group of people. But we have another group of people that's here, and it's not here as it is in this history. So in this history, you have this group of people who have a midnight cry and then have a, a true midnight cry. And if you're going to try to place this in this history, well, you would have to place it um, between August 11th, 1840 and April 19th, 1844. But in our history, that's one way mark, right? So this is the empowerment of the first angel. And this is the arrival of the second angel. So we can't have a midnight cry in between November or September 11th and September 11th. There's just not enough time in there. Um, so in, in trying to understand this, what I see is that even though the second angel arrives here, that this history here between August 11th and April 19th is going to occur in this history. Right? So it's going to occur here. And, but still the question is how we fit that in. Um, so you see, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, sh last time I confused you, and this time I don't want to confuse you. But if, if we look at this carefully, uh, we can see that it's, it's not as simple as we would like it to be. We can't just say, well, this is priests and this is Levites because our lines have all this overlap. Now, one of the things that was done is that we had in this history, we had Miller. Miller is representing this increase of knowledge. I mean, to obviously with the formalization here of Jeff in 1996 and the formalization in 1833 by Miller, really Jeff is on his own, as is Miller. I mean, if you wanna call this, this movement and, and this the Millerite movement, there is no movement here in, in this history with the formalization of the message. The movement begins here a little bit before the empowerment, but really it takes off with August 11th, 1840. And in this history then, if we're going to look at what group is empowered, well, that group that's empowered is, is a group that's earlier on in the message it's not a group that's later on in the message. So I, I hope you're trying to follow where I'm going here in that um, one of the things that I've tried to point out is that we made a mistake of trying to say that these are people. Because Jeff here, he's being typified by the work of Miller, but Jeff is not Miller. That is, as an individual, he's a part of this movement. He doesn't have to go through all of Miller's history. He just has to uh, fulfill the role at the time that parallels the role of Miller. And he does that here. Now, when he, we get over into this history, even though Jeff is a highly respected person, and really I, I still think of his, him as our leader in this movement, it's the movement now that's going to be paralleled here in some way. And so 
you know, my proposal, so here's my proposal in just sort of, a, in a nutshell, is that we have, we have Miller and the Millerite movement continues. Now, if I was going to say who that, move, if I was gonna give a name to that, instead of giving it to Jeff, I would just say it's FFA. So we have this group called FFA and FFA would parallel this Millerite movement. It's Future for America. Um, now sure, at different times, Jeff was combined with other ministries, those ministries left. Um, we also know that uh, uh, we had a major split. Uh, a group tried to take over FFA, but they, they didn't succeed. FFA is still FFA. Um, now we also have, uh, so we have this group FFA, which is the Millerites. But we also have something else happening. We have a movement. Now FFA in, is a movement, but it's a movement that's, um, it's run out of Arkansas, it's run by Jeff, and he's, he wanted to expand this. So FFA, eventually what happened is all kinds of people and all kinds of groups become involved in this movement. And the light that came in this history is, um, didn't come from FFA, didn't come from Jeff. I mean, it did, but it didn't as well. And we know that because one is, there's more information than one man could possibly produce. Um, but this light and, and the thing about this message that I saw at the time that I came in is that light started to come in more and more quickly in a progressive manner. It just accelerated. A great amount of light came and it just came so fast. And, and Jeff has even made this comment, you know, we'd have some new piece of information. We might have six months to digest it before something else came along. But it just became so thick and fast that when you're just looking at something, some new new light came and you have to look at that and you just couldn't even put all these things together. And we started to see that in 2016 with, with the story of Esther. Um, um, there was just all kinds of things that were happening. The understanding of midnight. And we didn't even have time in 2016 when I was a student at the School of the Prophets. Uh, we didn't even have time uh, um, you know, at least Stephen and I should remember what that was about. And it was about called the binding off. It was the binding off um, camp meeting that we had and, and the school of the prophets was all spo so supposed to be about the binding off. We had memory verses that addressed to the binding off. Um, so, uh, you know, so we had all of this, uh, all of this light. And yet we couldn't even process it in 2016. And then I remember the light from Ezekiel came. Jeff was really excited about that. He said, lot's going to come from Ezekiel. But then right away, he's studying um, uh, the Roman emperors, right? So this, this new light came and, and uh, also the French Revolution. So you have the French Revolution being studied, all this information just flooding in in 2016. And of course, in 2016, then we get Raphia and Paneum in, in the end of December, and then this just goes on and on and on, right? So my point is, FFA isn't the source of light. Now, it's being filtered through, through Jeff, rightly so, because he has a large base of knowledge, but as an individual, he obviously can't represent the movement. Now, we know in 2017, there was this attempt at organization, um, starting in the fall, uh, with the Romanian camp meeting. And um, we also had, uh, um, you know, lots happened. And, and when that camp meeting happened, like it was all secretive. Nobody knew what happened because some stuff happened there and we weren't allowed to know, which was really kind of disturbing uh, to me uh, what was happening in 2017. And then in 2018, uh, you know, the movement behind the scenes was beginning to try to be hijacked. Everything was being set up. And then, of course, we saw in 2019 uh, the, the split in the movement, the new movement that came out of this movement. And so if you're going to try to argue, you know, what groups are being talked about, um, you know, was FFA tested? You know, who, who went through this test that, that, that happened here? How do we fit this in to this history? Where do we look in Millerite history 
to see this. And where we normally go is we go to this part of this history. And so we're, we're shrinking this down and we're putting it into this group. And, and the group name that we chose was the priests. And, and we started that, we're gonna just do it here like this way, 2014 um, to 2000, we'll say to 2019. I don't know why I wrote a seven there. 2014 to 2019. So here you have this, this test um, where the priests are being tested. Now, I would say that FFA is not the priests. So this is, this is, FFA is not the movement. It's the leadership, but there's this group called the priests. And these priests, we, we use all kinds of illustrations for them. It's the wheat and the tares was done in regard to this group. Uh, we also have the true priests and the false priests. Um, um, you know, we looked at the true Passover and the fal false Passover in Samuel Snow's letters. And we try to understand what groups are being addressed. Now, I think that the key to this is, is what I was talking about at the beginning. Because we know that this number here, 622, addresses the history of FFA. In 2017, we began this move towards organization. And the center of that chiasm that you're going to read about, uh, the 777 chiasm, is June 22nd, 2017. And, and June 22nd, 2017 becomes the symbol of FFA. And it has to do with all this work that's being done um, prior to that time that's being symbolized by FFA. But then you're going to have a change that's going to happen. And that change is going to happen in 2017, in the midst of this history here. And in 2017, um, it's this group, the priests, that are going to be separated, the true and the false priests. Now, I don't know if people like what I'm doing here, taking FFA and separating it out. Um, you know, this may be, maybe it's, it's not the correct application of it. Because this, and this could be misunderstood. But my point is that FFA had a particular work of laying a foundation. But now you're going to have this, this group here, the priests. Now, FFA, as individuals, they're part of the priests. But FFA is something different. It, it has to do with an organizational structure. Now, it's, it's a, a minimalist organizational structure. It starts the School of the Prophets. Um, right in, in uh, you know from 2011 to 2014 and and does all this work lays all this this groundwork it funds all this, these ministries so funds are funneled through FFA but when we talk about a reform line a reform line is a group of people that are being tested and I don't believe that FFA is ever being tested individuals within FFA are as the group of the priests now, my view then, if we look at, at, at this history, we have, we have Millerites, and, and we have Miller, and we have Samuel Snow. Now, Samuel Snow does not represent a person in our history. He represents a group of people. And the question is, who does he represent? Or what group that we could look at would represent uh, Samuel Snow. Now, if you look at Samuel Snow as an individual, we know that Samuel Snow fell away. That is, even if you start to read uh, his writings in 1844, and, and, and his writings even in 1843, you can see that he thinks that, that he's special. So he has this impression that he is a special person. And um, and he begins to fall away. Now, you know, I've tried to understand this problem because we've had all these individuals who tried to claim to be Samuel Snow, and I always wonder why they would want to be, because we know Samuel Snow falls away. He believes that he's a prophet, and 
He believes he's the prophet Elijah. And he's very deceptive. If you read his books, he, he can't tell the truth. He, he's not honest, which is really interesting about Samuel Snow. Now, Samuel Snow, of course, is the one giving this message. And, and, but a group of people is going to be tested. And the group of the people that are going to be tested are the people who give that message, which is Samuel Snow, and the people who receive that message. Because in order to be tested, you have to be tested by a message. And those that receive the second angel's message are tested by it. So in this history here, if we're, we're just going to look at this group here, and we're going to use it as an illustration of this group, the priests. We can see that there's going to be true and false priests. And, and they're going to be giving a message. But they're going to be tested by that message as well. Now, the priests... In, in our history, if you look at it, well, who are we giving this message to? We're giving this message to the priests. And, and this becomes a problem as well. But that's what happened in Millerite history, really. Samuel Snow came along and gave a message to Millerites. And Millerites gave that message to Millerites. The, the, the Midnight Cry message was not a message that really went out to the world. The world had already received Miller's message and rejected it. Um, so now we're going to talk about who we're going to present a message to because we believe that we're going to set, present a message to the Levites. And the Levites, we say, are Seventh-day Adventists, not the organization, not the organizational structure because that's been passed by. We're not expecting the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, to accept the message that we're giving. But we are expecting that individuals are going to receive that message. Now, when you try to put this in this line, this actually comes after the close of probation. But the Millerites, because they believe, I mean, they're still presenting the message you could say to the world, but really they're preaching to themselves. It's Millerites only who can actually understand this message that's being given. And because this message is, is a difficult message that they're presenting, it, it deals with chronology and typology and all these ideas. They're already been rejected by the world. Now, they're sure there might be some people who come in in this history as individuals, but there isn't a massive amount of people joining the Millerite movement in the seventh month movement. It's a revival among those that are in the tearing time. And it's not until after October 22nd here, 1844, that they, they then get this, this line that is, is giving this message again. They have to have the sanctuary truth um, and all these different truths. So when, when we deal with this history here and we're trying to look at this, we know that this midnight and midnight cry, generally when we look at this, this is actually the midnight and the midnight cry of, if I'm putting it here, this would be the midnight cry of the priests. But then we also put it into the future and we use midnight and the midnight cry for the Levites. And then we use Midnight and Midnight Cry for the Nephilims. And then we use the Sunday Law and the Loud Cry for the line of the 144,000. So we have four different lines that we're taking this history from, and we're trying to apply it to these different groups. Now, so when I look at the priests, I would say that they're typified by Ezekiel and Snow. And there's lots of reasons why, because we know Ezekiel and Snow are the same group, right? And, and this is based upon chronology. Ezekiel is definitely chronology. Snow is chronology. And, and so these priests, the group that's going to accept this message, um, the priests, they're addressing chronology. They have to grapple with calendars. They have to address these things. Now, the other thing that we have in in Millerite history, is we have August 11th, 1840. And we know that August, Jeff just did a presentation where he lined up uh, the beginning of this period of time from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. So, Amen. Yeah, so if, if you know, you may have noticed this, uh, what he did, uh, but he basically took October 22, and um, you put August 15th here, 1844, 
and he lined this up, and, and hopefully I'm doing this correctly, but he lined this up with August 11th, 1840, and 1838. And, and, I'm, and I can't remember everything he said about it, um, but the idea is that this, this is, is a parallel. They changed the dates, what it was, Theodore. They, the, both of the dates needed to be, uh, you know, like in the beginning one there, Lich had to fine tune the date. Right, yeah, oh, so there, there, there's them. a refining. Yeah, there's a refining of these dates. So here we have a date, then it's refined. And his main point was that this was a specific date. So the thing about August 11th, 1840, is it's a specific date. The thing about October 22nd, 1844, is it's a specific date. And then when we look at our lines, we can see that we have November 9th. So I'm going to get rid of this. Right, so we have 9-11. Now we're going to have a specific date, November 9th. Um, but then we're going to refine this date. This date is, go is going to pass, right? And then we're going to refine that date. And he's saying that this refined date is July 18th, okay, 2020. Now, in trying to deal with this, we know that November 9th was a close of probation for the priests. Now we can start it at September 7th, going through to November 9th, even to November 15th, maybe even all the way to January 11th. Um, this is that period of 126 days. We know that in this period of time, that that light is sufficient. The people who have, and, and this is my view, the people who have seen the light and have rejected it will never receive the light it comes after, no matter how much they want to, no matter how much they try to, they won't be able to because their character has been manifested already because they've rejected great light. And so even July 18th being an attack on Nashville being fulfilled, it's not going to dissuade those who rejected light. They're going to, and, and, and this we can see that people dig in their heels in, in the face of the strongest evidence. We saw it with the Pharisees. We saw it in so many histories that you can see this, where there's a marvelous manifestation of the power of God. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He had all the evidences, but it didn't matter. And so we're going to see that that's the case. That may not be really a very nice message to say, but we, don't, we can't judge people's hearts. So I can't say anything about an individual. I can't say which individuals received that light because some people may, may not have really received that light, even though they've been connected with the message. So I'm not, not talking about individuals, I'm just talking about as a group, those that have received that light who saw it, uh, they're not going to be able to, re to receive further light. So they've gone into darkness. Now, uh, this is the midnight chiasm that, that we're addressing. And, and the midnight chiasm, if you remember, uh, it goes from January 11th, 2020, and it goes to March 21st, uh, 2020, 20, March, March 27th, 2021. And it's about, it's, it's connecting to the, to the message for the Levites. So we know we have this other group, the Levites. And who are the Levites then in this line? Now, if I'm saying that the priests are Ezekiel and Snow, well, we could look at another group here, and we could say that Ezekiel and Snow typify the work that's done by Snow, or Ezekiel's typifying Snow, and Snow is giving this message, and the Levites could represent the Millerites who aren't the ones who understand this truth. And, and they go from being Millerites to, to accepting this message of Snow. And Ezekiel. So in our history, we would say that there's this group of priests, but as they give this message to the Levites, the Levites begin to give that same message. So they're going to give that message. And that message is going to occur before the Sunday law. So this has to do with this other group, the Nephilim. And this is where I've had uh, the most difficulty in trying to, to understand this role. Uh, the way that I look at it 
is that the Protestants in our line, they're going to have a, a, a greater fall. All these evils, all this error that has crept in, um, and they're going to join with the Catholic, Catholic Church and uh, in enforcing Sunday observance, right? So we're, the Republican horn is going to fall. But at the time when the image of beast, the beast is being formed, we have Protestants who are joining with us. Now, um, we have placed those as being metonym. And, and I'm not saying that they're not, but then we, we really need to define if we have first the church, then the world. Is the world, is anyone in the world going to receive that message? And my view has always been after the Sunday law, during the loud cry, is that people will join um, the truth, but they will be martyrs. That is, um, the choice that they make is just going to end in their death. Those are the types yeah. of people that are going to be joining this message. It's definitely not a peace and safety message, especially after the Sunday law. There isn't going to be that opportunity to have fellowship and churches and potlucks and, and picnics and all those types of things. Everything's going to be life and death. And we know that there are people that they may not know all the truth, but they're still going to stand for the truth because they see the injustice of what is occurring. And, and, and that group of people I would normally place as the nephonim. It is, at least that's how we, we looked at it before. But then, you know, in trying to think about it, the nephonim are the group of people that are associated with the temple. So, so go back to my view that these would be Protestants. So I kind of think that mostly we would think this was the world, but we never defined it. But if you look at the Protestants that join, the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanims, I could see all of them joining for the Sunday law. Now, if we, we deal with the line of after the Sunday law, all we're dealing with is the world. We're dealing with atheists, with uh, people who are Buddhists and, and Hindus and, um, and maybe some people who were Protestants who didn't understand truth. And there was all kinds of individuals. But as far as groups, uh, this is Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon that escape out of the hand of the papacy. So this is not those that are, are Christians, for the most part. These would be people that are non-Christians. And, and I don't think it's going to be a long period of time. Once we get past the Sunday law, I would think that the period of the loud cry in which the message goes to the world is going to be a period of intense turmoil, turmoil for a very short period of time. And everybody in that situation will have made their choice. The truth will have gone out. People will, will decide which side they're on. Christ will stand up and send, say, he, him that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He'll, him that is filthy, be filthy still. Probation will have closed. And then the plagues will pour out. And then we're going to have the time of Jacob's trouble, where God's people who are alive, 144,000 who've been sealed with the seal of God, who have Christ's character perfectly reproduced in them, they're still going to go through this experience of, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, and yet not sin. And the wicked no matter how, many, how much plagues fall upon them, no matter how many evidences are shown to them, they're not going to repent from their wickedness because they've made their choice. They've sealed their fate. And then special resurrection happens. And after the special resurrection, the day and hour of Christ's return is announced. So God's people now know when Jesus is going to come back. And then Christ will return and they'll be waiting for him. And of course, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then which we are alive, we'll go up together to meet with them, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, right? That is the message of Adventism. And then to try to look at what's happening here in this line is um, we have the priests and Levites. So as we're saying, we got, we got priests. These are Seventh-day Adventists. Levites are Seventh-day Adventists. So then we would have to say the Nethanim are Protestants. These are SDAs. And so these are the groups of people, and all these groups 
are going to stand uh, at the Sunday Law. Now, of course, when we say the Sunday Law, th there's obviously the Sunday Law in the United States, um, and that's going to go out through the world. It's going to intensify. It's not like it just happens one day, and there's, you know, everything that there is in the Sunday Law. It's going to begin, and, and we say that after December 25th. So maybe the first Sunday Law will be put into effect on December 26th, which is a Sunday. It's possible. My view is, though, that the line of, of the priests ends, and anything having to do with time setting ends. That is, we might be able to look at some symbolic connections to the future, but we won't be able to predict any events. Now, it is even still possible that, you know, we don't fully understand everything yet. That's always a possibility, um, and always one we should keep in mind. So maybe things will unfold a little bit differently. Um, but I think Jeff's argument here that November 9th is, is showing this correction of time. Um, now, of course, here there's not a, a date that they're setting. They're not setting August 15th. But there is a point of time in which they correct this. And this happens in this history here between September 7th and January 11th. So by January 11th, we have our message. We now understand it's that this is a message that we're going to give. It's a message about July 18th, 2020. We've uh, formed that message, formalized it in some way um, in this history. And now we're giving this message about July 18th, 2020. So, well, it went a little bit better than I thought so, so far. Any thoughts on this? Amen. Theodore, I have just a quick question. Could, okay. you, could you unpack a little bit further for me, the September the 7th. Uh, I have a few thoughts, but I just wanted to hear a little bit if you could unpack the September the 7th. Well, well the idea of September the 7th is that it parallels um, what happened in 977. That is, it, right. it parallels uh, this, uh, these various tests that are going to happen. Um, th this true and false worship contrast and, and you can tie 977, of course, uh, to Elijah as well. Right. Um, you obviously see church and state connected there, so it also typifies the Sunday law. Uh, yeah, to try to unpack it, there's a lot actually dealing with There's a lot there, right? Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. So for me personally, right. though, September 7th, being part of the Midnight Chiasm, it was the point when Jeff stood up in opposition right. to this apostasy, you would okay. parallel it to, to Moses standing up um, at Baal Peor. Um, so, you know, so there's, there's and, and if you want to look at, I guess, the, the disobedient prophet, we, we call him that because he was disobedient. Yeah. He still gave the Amen. message uh, there to Jeroboam. And that message is the midnight cry message, right? We can see that's attached to the midnight cry. So, so there's part of the problem, I think, that we also have with these lines is that, you know, September 7th is a very specific date. And if you want to call it a prediction, you know, we didn't predict September 7th, but it's there in the structure of the July 18, 2020 prediction. Right. Amen. Uh, so when I saw it on September 7th, I recognized it for what it was, but I still didn't know, and, and maybe I'm a bit ashamed to say this, but I still didn't know what side I was on. That is, I'd already made a decision uh, about a week before this um, because of what had happened in, in, in Germany, in Warburg, um, that I already decided that July 18th was what I was sticking with and I wasn't really going to choose sides. That is, I didn't know enough. And, and this is just the way that I deal with things. I knew what the truth was. But I didn't know all this stuff behind the scenes, all the politics, all these types of things. You know, I, I, so I, and I wasn't going to let my personal emotions or feelings affect how I was going to uh, approach truth. That was, that was my position. And it was a covenant I had with God. We, we struggled through it. And so when I got to September 7th, all I saw is that this confirmed July 18, 2020. But it didn't tell Amen. me which side I was going to be on. Because to me, Amen. the true side would pick July 18, 2020. And that happened right. on September 7th. 
right? No. It hadn't been, you know, Jeff hadn't stood for it. And, and there was a belief for a long time that Parminder was going to accept it. Me, me and Stephen had this belief that, you know, Parminder was really kind of accepting right. it. Um, and, and so, you know, it kind of puzzled because of the way he would talk to us personally was different than what he actually thought. So he was being right. deceptive about it. So right. anyway, um, so the September 7th becomes really, really important. Now, mm -hmm. when you read yep. the paper on the 777 chiasm, I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't actually address that parallel of September 7th with um, September 23rd, 2017. So uh, even though it's there, um, there's this, this structure that happens in the midnight chiasm that happens in the, the 777 chiasm. Um, sure. And, and, and so there are some really important things that we can learn about this that, that I don't think, I, did, I didn't address it in my paper, like all the conclusions that I could have. I, I tend not to. I tend to put the information there and, and let people kind of interpret it themselves. So the chronology mm -hmm. is kind of more objective if I put too many opinions. In, and that's sure. why I really like doing these kinds of presentations. Because one is they can be misunderstood. And also- Yeah, amen. Talk. And I can be totally. wrong with my opinions. And somebody thinks, well, he said this, so he must believe this and he's in error. When really, I'm just thinking out loud. I'm trying to yeah. understand something. I'm not saying I have all the answers. Cause, and, and that's the problem being a teacher. Because you're being, yes. you like to speak with authority. You don't like to just mumble and say, well, I'm not sure about, Amen. This, I'm not sure about that. But I am sure about certain things. And it's the things that I'm sure about that I can speak boldly about. And that's, objective objective things like numbers and dates i can say yeah. this structure exists it's an objective reality what does it mean and in the paper i'm trying to address um can we know from the structure of the 777 chiasm that we can make this prediction with of july 18th 2020 with a certainty and i don't even really answer it um because i think the answer will be different for different people based on whether they have a faith in God or not, and whether they can see these things or not. So for me, Amen. I'm 100% certain about something. It doesn't really sure. help anybody else. You need to be certain. You have to study it out. And you're going to have right. to do through your own struggle and yeah. if things don't work out the way that we expect them to. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm a cautious person. I'm not. I'm creative, somewhat spontaneous. But I've always been cautious. When I go backpacking, I plan out my route to the detail. I weigh my food, and I know every meal mm. that I'm going to take, and I take one extra meal, and it's a good backpack trip if I use everything in my pack. I have one meal left over, and I haven't used my first aid kit. Um, so, you know, these are this is the way that I plan. Now, of course, I would go backpacking with my best friend and let him plan the trip, which would always be horrendous because he had no idea what we were doing. So sometimes I would blindly trust in him and we would end up uh, lost and, um, <laughs> you know, stuck in, in the, on the trail for longer than we should have been and so forth. Yeah, um, so Chuck has, has um, something he wants to say about this. Thanks, Theodore. So, yeah, okay. Thanks, Brian. So Chuck, what do you want to say? I don't hear you, Chuck. I see you, but I don't hear your voice because you got to unmute yourself. Okay, here we go. Uh, with respect to my uh, cry, my voice coming out of Alaska. Yeah. I've been rather loud. Uh, has it, I've got now I've got family in Washington D.C. Uh, I've got a niece who's married to a a uh, guy from China, works for NASA. I'm, I'm butting heads with a lot of scientists. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's say this is impossible. I've also got another guy that's in intelligence uh, and has just been moved up a ladder over there. And he says, look, Chuck, I'll take care of you. And when you show up, <laughs> because of what you're saying, uh, uh, you're talking about missiles and nuclear weapons and uh, 
you know where they're coming from, you know where they're landing. And maybe that's too much for them to digest all at once. Yeah. Uh, but I have uh, also, <clears throat> so now this, this guy from China, he's got a big family mm -hmm. and they're Christians. I've also got another guy that has some charts that's in Africa. I've got another guy that works for a law firm that's a Christian, has dropped all his law stuff and picked this up and is worried about helping people. Uh, that's in Mexico. Uh, these Levites or Methanims are coming out of the woodwork. My audience has gotten rather large uh, recently and the uh, uh, the impact of that is humbling to me and you know my heart weeps when I talk to guys in uh, in Mexico and they've got uh, crematoriums putting out columns of smoke in every big city in Mexico they people disappear off the street their family can't go to the hospital and they 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 don't have a coffin and they disappear in these uh crematoriums hmm. uh, and you know the, there's one place uh what is it uh, an island out in the caribbean they're running around with guillotines yeah well so uh, so i know the world's a bad place what point do you have to make because well cause i'm we saying that about these, this a bit and these, these levites yeah are popping up Somebody, somebody told them to move, move out of town a long time ago. They, a lot of these people have established farms. Uh, you know, and yeah, and they're asking a lot of questions. Yeah, you know, and the, and the interesting point, you know, I mean, we talk about Levites and we talk about priests, and and we know that what's going to be tested is character. Now, of course, we know that character doesn't, doesn't happen by accident. Um, it, it's developed. And character is shown in a crisis. It's not developed in a crisis. You know, we go through experiences day by day, making choices. It's going to develop character. And that's why I believe that when, when people accept the message, it's, even though we have all this intellectual stuff that we're doing, it's not about intellect. It's about choices that a person has made along the way and uh, and those choices are bringing them closer to the character of christ or farther away from the character of christ now as we approach these crises people are going through some drastic character development they're making choices and those choices are going to uh rapidly increase their 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 character because they're going through more and more choices and they're having to make decisions and so when they stand and die for the truth, they don't necessarily have a complete intellectual understanding of things. What they've, one is they've seen those who have represented the truth in their character. So that's a powerful thing, being lifted up as an enzyme, right? And, and, and of course, the things that we've said to them, you know, if they've just pushed them aside, they're rejecting light, and that's part of character. If they start to accept them, even though they don't understand everything fully, it takes character to accept the truth. But God ultimately is the judge. Now, we can talk about, about that a bit later. Um, I want to just make a comment here. So um, I want you all to read the paper. And, and I know there's people going to be watching this video. If you're watching this video and you want the paper, you just email Theodore James Turner at gmail.com and ask for the 777 chiasm. You'll, I'll just send it to you. Uh, hopefully it'll be a little more refined by the time you watch the video. I have corrected some of the typos in it, but I usually expect that my paper is always gonna have a number of typos once I publish them. But, but I want people to, to look at this and I want people to respond with, with ideas. Uh, I really want people to see, to have suggestions about what it means, what the chiasm means, um, because I think it will be very clear. Now, I do a lot of background information in the paper that you're going to be familiar with, uh, but there's a lot of details that 
that you're not going to be familiar with. But I'm, I'm just going to address something here um, that I, I do address in the paper, but I, I want to uh, to deal with it. If you'll put everybody that's here on, on your, just put us on that list, you'll save yourself a lot of email. Oh yeah, I'm going to put all you guys on the list, but I'm saying some okay. people might watch the video who aren't on my email list. So everybody on my email list is going to get a copy of the paper. Thank you. I get to the Zoom, right? Um, but yeah, but if there's somebody watching this video who's not on my email list, they just happen to come across it, then you can email me and I'll send you this paper. Now, so I'm going to erase this here. Now, I talked about this FFA being 622. And um, to me, what happened in 2017 is a transition from FFA being the leadership uh, to Christ being the leader. And, and I'm not denying Jeff's leadership, not by any stretch of the imagination, because he's, he's an elder. And, and, he, and the reason that he deserves to be an elder is he's being able to admit mistakes that he's made um, because we all make mistakes. So he's shown that he can be a leader in this movement. But there was this transition. And um, so that, that chiasm, so I'm just going to kind of draw this, you know, where you got June 22nd is on this side of it, you will see. And you're going to have on this side of it, so I'll do it this way. June 22nd and 23rd. June 23rd is on this side of it. And this is going to go all the way to December 25th, 2021. And in this history, there's going to be this, we'll just put 504 days and 273 days. And this is going to be March 27, and this is November 9th, 2019, right? And over on this side of it, we're going to have December 21st, 2020, 2012. This is the Mayan calendar. And we know that this is a period of 777 days. And then I counted a period of 777 days here. And this is my birthday, February 6th. Uh, 2015. It's my 52nd birthday. And this period of time, so if you go back to my birthday, February 6th, 63, this period of time here is 18,998, 93 days. And if you go to this date, May 9th, 2014, which was uh, my 33rd wedding anniversary if I was still married to my first wife. Um, uh, this one here is 18,720 days from my birthday. That is, this one, 18,720, is 360 times 52. And this one here, uh, 18993 is 365.25 times 52. But there is another period of time here. Uh, there's, um, how do they call it? The Zolp, Zolp, Zolpquin or something. I can't spell it, I'll just spell it messily. This is a period of time uh, that uh, the Mayan Jews, that is 260 days. And they have another period of time called uh, scenarios. I can't remember what it's called. It's a 13-day cycle. And uh, these two combine to create a, um, a longer period of time with the 365-day calendar to create a period of time that is 18,980 days. It's 13 days short of this period. So that's based on a 365 day here. So that's 365 times 52. And, and so this is a major cycle of theirs. Um, now I bring this up because if you take this first, uh, this other calendar and you put it here, you can divide this period of 273 days here. That's how much it is from 52 
prophetic years to 52 solar years is 273 and 504. So we have the same parallel here and here. And, and then I also go 777 days here to March uh, 24th, 2017. And I go back here 777 days to September 23rd, 2017. This is a presentation I did at Lambert Church on July 18th in Samuel Snow's letters, saying it was the prediction before midnight. So this is all in the paper. I'm just kind of going through this cursorily. Um, my point, though, is that uh, these, these chiasms, this chiasm here, which is uh, 3,291 days, it has June 22nd, 23rd, the dividing line between them as the middle date, this refers to this work that's being done under FFA and laying this foundation. But the change happens here. Now, uh, there's actually a meeting in Italy that happens, but it's, it's not an organizational meeting in 2017. This is 2017. Um, but we know that this is when this change in organization starts to happen. So in Italy, uh, and then they have one in uh, September of 2017. Now, you'll see here, uh, I'm actually at the School of the Prophets doing a series on uh, Samuel Snow's letters and, um, and the book of, of Ezra uh, here, um, or Samuel Snow's letters and, and chronology, not the book of Ezra yet. That's going to be the next year. This is on Samuel Snow's letters. And, and it's at this time that they're finishing off that uh, camp meeting, the organizational camp meeting in Romania. It's at, I think it ends like the 22nd of September or something like that. So anyway, the point is, I'm here. The, the last day was the 11th of September. 11th was the last day? Okay. So the 11th, September 11th was the last day. So this is then another 11 days past September 11th to when I'm speaking at Lambert Church. And um, so, but anyway, this, this, this presentation falls on, if you look in the paper, it's, it's a special day, and that's the Revelation 12 prophecy. And, and my point is you're going to see all these false prophecies that are connected with this structure. December 21st, 2012 is a false prophecy. September 23rd. We also have, of course, November 9th, October 13th. Those are also false prophecies. Um, because there's false, But the chronology, I believe, is correct. I believe that's what's being said. Now, um, so the thing about this is, you know, I showed people at the beginning before the, uh, we got into it, into the other study, we dealt with this date, that it's the center of June uh, 22nd, 2011, and June 22nd, 2014. And the center date is this December 21st, 2012. And I've been using this Mayan date um, in all kinds of ways. There's hundreds of different coincidences that occur with this Mayan calendar. Um, I can safely say that when I look at the statistical connection between the Mayan calendar and our lines that we've established, that the, the probability has more than 100 zeros uh, by far. So it's, it's astronomical. It's more than all the particles of the universe. Um, so if every particle in the universe bought a lottery ticket, uh, it still wouldn't represent the odds of one of them winning. So, um, so anyway, so this December 21st, 2012 becomes really important. And this was important back in 2018 already in November. I'd already recognized this, this date. Um, uh, more the start of the date, more the start of the calendar rather than this date but recognize the Mayan calendar. And it's just been recently that we've really refined this, what December 21st means. But um, another little interesting fact. So this is my 52nd birthday, which you know, sort of throws me into the mix here as part of this line. Um, but I, I know that there's another person who shares my birthday. Um, he was born in 1911 on February 6th. Anybody know who this is? It was born in 1911, February 6, 1911. 
Can you guess? I was born on his 52nd birthday. Is he a Millerite somewhere? No. Somehow? <laughs> Guy named Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Cool. Reagan. And Reagan has a part to play in the time of the end, which I think is rather interesting. Amen. Um, so I always known that Reagan had my birthday, right? It sh we shared a birthday. I never thought it was significant in any way. But the fact that this is, you know, 18,993 days between our two birthdays, I think is pretty interesting um, between here and then this, this birthday here. So we're both, this is 52 years. And, and I've looked at a lot of people's birthdays lately. Now, you know, some people say, you know, birthdays, you know, they're just chance. And, and obviously, I don't believe that they have to do with astrology. You can't predict a person's future based on their birthdays. But we know that birthdays have a symbolic representation. Um, they're anniversaries. Uh, they show up again and again, just like we saw with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, being born at noon on October 13th in 1989, and Tess Lambert being born on November 9th, 1990, 391 and a half days apart. Um, that has significance. It tells you something. Um, and so I think that this tells us something as well, that, that we are all tied up in this wheel within a wheel. I still believe that our lives are intertwined with these timelines based on the choices that we have made. We, we provide each of us individually a role in, in last day events for good or for bad. So being on, on, you know, having my birthday here and marking this date says nothing about my salvation, says nothing about my place in this movement, says nothing about whether I'm right or wrong about anything that I say. It just shows that these lines are correct. And we need to keep that clear in our minds. We need to recognize that this is God's movement. And I believe that at this point, God took control of this movement in a way that, that is just absolutely amazing. And the leadership, the organization that they thought that they were forming was the organization of the false priests. But the true organization that has occurred here, we, we better not uh, stand against it. This is God. He's the one who's directed this, this movement. So all this stuff that was happening, even in spite of all the craziness, God has seen what was going to happen beforehand, and he has prepared us. And he's given us, to me, he's given us this chronology as a safeguard. that We can look at line upon line and we can, we can see that he's going to put righteousness or, or judgment to the line, righteousness to the pl plummet. Um, and uh, so, you know, and, and Chuck says, you know, the dates, he's glad to hear that the dates from his life are on this line and, and, and other people's line, dates are, that his aren't the only ones on this line. And, and I think that's an important point uh, that we need to see is that God has a part for each one of us to play. And that part is for good or for ill. And whether it's for good or for ill is not based upon the stars. It's not based upon chance. It's not based upon um, some sort of uh, predestination that we're predestined to play some specific role. It's based upon the choices that we make. And those choices are moral choices. Prophecy is moral. When we accept light, we are making a moral choice for good. When we reject light, we are making a moral choice for ill. And so, you know, that to me is what's being shown here. Um, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez and Tess, they're on these lines. It doesn't make them uh, right or wrong. It's the choices that they make that make them right or wrong. So um, I think there we can close with prayer and then we can have uh, say our goodbyes and maybe, unless there's somebody who wants to add something uh, to this. Uh, and and uh, Stephen just says with 504, if you drop the zero and you add it to 273, 
you get 327, which is in um, the other way of writing March 27th. So I mean, you can all read that, of course, but um, uh, you know, this is, this is the thing is that we, we can look at these analysis of all these dates and all these numbers, but they're really meaningless um, unless we understand that these one are part of a structure. So um, mathematical analysis of a structure can tell us some things, but again, we don't determine any of these things based on mathematical structure or analysis alone. It's about the structure. Everything fits into a structure. And these structures are what make these things highly unlikely, um, actually impossible to have incurred by chance because they're so interlocked with each other. And I've used the analogy before of a timepiece. If you find a timepiece in the sand, in the desert, you don't imagine that it just came about by chance. You know that it was designed. And this has all the complexities, maybe even greater than a timepiece. So, you know, so God's hand is in it. The part that we're going to play is going to be determined by our choices. So, Have you looked at the coordinates uh, in a class yet? No, I haven't looked at the coordinates in the class yet. Um, I'm probably going to deal with those things on Friday evenings. Okay. Um, just because they're, they're not really fitting into these other presentations, which I want to wrap up soon. Uh, the, the one today, of course, is the structure of prophetic chronology. That's why I'm dealing with structure here. Um, and then uh, the one on Thursday is dealing with Daniel 11. And, and I probably only have like one more presentation for this structure of prophetic chronology. Uh, till it's 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 done whether I'll, I'll continue with something else after that uh, we'll see um, the uh, November 9 is a center of a chiasm as well right yes it becomes the center of a chiasm as well right so now and, and it's parts of other chiasms all these chiasms are all linked together I really would like to you know be able to draw them up, like all on one page Just yeah they stack this, up all this and after November 9 they really stack up Yes, but also not just that they stack up, but well, you know, like in the future, but they even stack up in the past. That is, we can, after November 9th, after September 7th and November 9th, we could start looking back in the past and seeing these way marks. Because as you pass through fulfilled prophecy, Ellen White says, as prophetic prophecy is being fulfilled, the, those fulfilled events reflect upon past events, and then those past events shine light in, in, ahead of us. Um, to give us light for our path. And she uses that primarily in the context of the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, that's what happened. But we see it also happening in our time. And so uh, definitely, you know, in 2017 is when I actually personally saw that we were fulfilling events, um, dealing with the prediction before midnight, because I was understanding Samuel Snow's letters. And so everything expanded from there. Uh, from uh, and really from June twenty second onward, if you want to put it that way. There was lots, of course, before, but I really think that God's taken this movement into His own hands, and that you see this was happening worldwide. But a lot of that light was shut down, unfortunately, and some of it has survived. You know, let's say if I had fallen away or something, and you know, God still would have had a way to do this without the way it's being done. God has a thousand different ways. Um, so God isn't dependent upon one of us to fulfill a role, but it's just Amen. the reality of what has happened. Uh, but, you know, if, if uh, the people stopped shouting, Jesus says the stones would cry out. And, and so God is always going to uh, complete his work with whoever uh, he can take. And, and really, Amen. the people that are left, that God has left it, to do this work, are not the best and the brightest. They're not the most talented. They're not the ones with the most resources. They're just the riffraff, like. Um, Amen. Like me and Chuck. Um, yeah, but, and me too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we're not the people that I would have chosen. Um, that's for sure. So, hey, anyway, Theodore, can, yeah. can I ask a question? Uh, a question about the prediction before midnight? Yeah. Was there also within this movement um, a false? A false prediction before midnight by Tabo or somebody else? Well, there was a controversy over it. So I wouldn't say it was a false prediction, but there was a, okay. a, a debate about it. So Tabo chose May 2nd as the symbol. 
And May 2nd is okay. really important. It's the center of the chiasm. It unlocked okay. it. But June, July 18th is really the prediction before midnight because that's okay. the prediction that we finally made was Samuel's yeah. last letter. And it's three days right. before midnight. And even Tabo taught that the predict three days, three days is a symbol of the prediction before midnight. He used it in the Butler and the Baker's uh, two dreams. And he used it in um, Ezra uh, at the river Ahava, the tarrying for three days. And we show this, see this showing up again and again. So, but yeah, there was a controversy. Um, but also if you want to look at it, as far as the message that was given, the faith prediction, if you want to put it there, put it that way, is November 9th. Because November right. 9th was to be the midnight cry. And to the new movement right. that was given on October 3rd when tests presented November 9th, but we see the midnight cries given October 13th, 10 days later. Okay. She set that up. You know, Parminder, maybe it's in God's providence that Parminder and Tess did what they did. I think so. But their prediction brought us into a type of time setting, which I'm opposed to time setting. Um, but it brought us into a type of time setting within this movement. And the thing I'm still not 100% certain of, I won't be probably until July 18th, is to see <laughs> how closely we can predict events outside of the movement itself. We've seen shadows of it but we've never made like a major prediction like this and been, you know, understood it completely and had it fulfilled the way that we saw. We, we, I made lots of predictions and they did come true, but they all came true within the movement and usually were part of, of this uh, progression of light that was coming. So it wasn't really, um, you know, this type of prediction. So we will see, but I believe that, you know, July 18th will happen. And How about uh, the great fire in Rome? The Great Fire in Rome was July 18. With yes, the, with I, the I, I, there, we'll see lots of these types of symbols. Like there's tons of right. them. Where, yeah. we have dates yeah. where we have the 10th day of the fifth month uh, being cities that are falling. We have July 18th with the fire in Rome. Um, I mean, yeah. there's just, you know, but the thing is, these are analysis after the fact, right? Once God has given us this light, we can then have all these witnesses, but it's not how we derived the date. And the problem that I have with people always referring to these things, I'm not saying it's wrong to, but if I'm going to present July 18th, I wouldn't start with, well, Rome burned on July 18th. Sure. I'm going to start, and, and on my Friday night studies, I'm dealing with that. I'm going to start with the solid biblical prophecies, Ezekiel, Daniel. I'm going to deal with the chronology of Ezra. I'm going to deal with the chiasms in the story of, of Jacob and Joseph. You know, I'm going to deal with the, the Leviticus 26 and the periods of 70 years, right? The end yeah. of the 2300 days, the beginning of the 2300 days and how they're connected. Samuel Snow's letters, Millerite history. I'm going to deal with these things that, that are the solid basis of how we came Pretty to solid, our, yeah. our conclusion. And then this other stuff is like the sprinkles on the cake. It's not even the yeah. ice you know? Totally. But it doesn't, if somebody doesn't understand how the cake was made, it, it, <laughs> the sprinkles don't really mean much. And that's what exactly. I lay down in this paper a little bit. I did write a paper, which I, I never published because it was like half done and it was really bombastic and, and pretentious. But, um, mm. you know, it was basically my uh, apology and defense type of thing. Sure. Regarding sure. this message. It was sort of the history of how I came to understand things. But, mm. you know, from a personal point of view, everything that I studied and presented became connected with July 18th, 2020. But I would have had no idea at the time where I was going with that. So, you know, I studied Revelation 9. I studied line upon line. I studied the chronology of the kings. I studied Ezra. I studied Samuel Snow's letters. All these things, not knowing that they all led to this prediction. And so, right. for me personally, to be involved in that, to see how it was laid out. Yeah. Nobody else, maybe, you know, Stephen might know a little bit and some other people, but very few people can actually appreciate how the truth unfolded and how it yeah. unfolded is just a big a testimony as what the conclusion is, because <laughs> you can see that it unfolded in such a way that there's no way anybody could ever predict it of what, how it was going to all fit together. Nobody Amen. Can, that can't be contrived. You know, I couldn't yeah. have thought about this like 20 years ago. And, no. <laughs> and made this up. 
Same with Bible prophecy, the way that I've studied Bible prophecy, is you can see that there's things there that the, the writers could never have seen. And, and, and so you can't look at Bible prophecy and say, oh, well, they just wrote the Bible after it happened. And so that's how they did it. You know, the book of Daniel must have been written in the, the second century BC. That's why it has all this fulfilled prophecy in Daniel 11, right? You know, that's the argument that's made. But if you actually look at it carefully, you can see that there's so many things in there that there's no way even somebody in the second century would have understood. I mean, yeah. one, they would have had no idea in the second century about Babylon and, and Belshazzar. You know, these people have been lost from history even by that time. Um, so, uh, and, and they had such misunderstandings about the chronology of that period. So you could never have had the 70 years captivity being laid out in these different writers that we know Ezekiel wrote when he was, says he wrote. We know that is a fact. It's not something that's disputable, but there's no way that he could have known 70 AD mm -hmm. <clears throat> that it would fit in uh, with his chronology. So, yeah. do you know oh. Theodore? Just as another question, uh, yeah. do you know who it was that uh, figured out the Malta and Nashville connection and those coordinates? Was it Odilio? Well, it was Odilio. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty profound. Yeah, there's no doubt about okay. it. And and that's the thing is God used different people with different minds. Uh, you know, I mean, I suggested to him Nashville because he had already been working out the coordinates. Right. And, and he just said, well, you know, he was thinking where he knew the attack was. And I said, well, Nashville. And he said, well, what do you mean, Nashville? I said, well, Ellen White describes a nuclear attack at Nashville. <laughs> right. But, you know, but I wouldn't have done the coordinate things like he did. Um, yeah. And figure that out. And, and I know that Chuck has, has some interesting ideas regarding coordinates as well. Yeah, um, he does. The problem with Chuck is he talks in metaphors. And I don't know yes, he what does. he's talking about. But, a little uh, bit, me too, Chuck. <laughs> so, you know, so we're going to, we're going to try to, I'm going to try to the stuff that Chuck has given me. And we're going to try to look at that as we get closer to Nashville and look at what he's, awesome. you know, I awesome. think it's valuable to look at. Even if Chuck yeah. is wrong, there's nothing wrong with looking at what he's I was, a, I was a 747 captain. I had to put where I was going into three boxes. <laughs> I put 36 degrees. Zero nine minutes, zero zero seconds. I had to fill in those squares. Yeah. And then I had, had three boxes that talked to each other, and that's what got me to rubber side down on the other side of the ocean. Yeah. So uh, when all this came up, my brother came up with three six nine. He said, "Chuck, what is this?" I mm -hmm. says, "I put it in a black box, you know." And uh, it came up that three six degrees, nine minutes, and no seconds came out to be the front porch of the Parthenon yeah. through which a missile would have to pass to get inside the Parthenon, a cruise missile. And I'm saying it's going to be a tomahawk, but this thing's coming from within. And I've got a coordinate from where it leaves from. So I've showed you that. Yeah. Pretty okay. awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we're going to look at these things. You know, and, you know, I don't know if Chuck is right or not, um, but, you know, as we approach this time, it's going to be useful to look at some of these, these ideas. Yeah. And we know that they did it with Samuel Snow's material. They looked at it, um, uh, even when they didn't agree with it. So I think, you know, we have a forum here in which we can do that as long as, you know, we, we're not going off into so, sort of a theological error. Um, because you know we're 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 studying to try to understand the truth here on this prediction, this is prophecy. So um, now I'm pretty tired out, and uh, I got lots of things. Thanks, Theodore. We so, appreciate uh, you. Yeah. So well, let's just close with prayer first, and and then we can say. Okay. okay. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are thankful for the light uh, that you've given us. And mostly, Lord, because we want to know you. And, uh, and it brings such conviction that your word is true. And, uh, and we know, Lord, that we've lived a faithless life uh, for the most part. We haven't trusted in you in the way that we should. Help us to trust in you now, in spite of anything that happens. Help us to know that you have led us that you will continue to lead us through any trial that comes our way. 
Thank you for each person. Be with them. May your angels watch over them. May your Holy Spirit speak to our heart and use us in speaking to others. And we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.